So, um, our passage today is in the bulletin. Let's let's look there at Luke chapter five, and I'll start reading with verse one. We'll go to verse eleven. Luke chapter five, verse one. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that is what we call the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full, they began to sink. When Simon saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then, John, then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats on shore, left everything, and followed him. A few months ago, a colleague of mine at DuPont, where I work, met, um, to, met some friends of his, or colleagues, to go fishing. They rented a boat with a captain, and for $30 per person with about a group of 10 people, he brought them along the Chesapeake Bay to all these hot spots for catching fish. And uh, they did that for a couple hours. And I had done this with a, co a few colleagues a few years ago. I think you were up in Boston at the time, Wendy, so I don't know if you remember this. We met at 5 a.m. to go around on the Chesapeake. We didn't catch a single fish. It was so bad that the guy from DuPont that organized the trip, my colleague, he gave fish to those of us who had um, paid the $30. And I don't know if you remember cooking this up, but he gave us some nice rockfish and, uh, from his own freezer. He, you know, he's, a, he's a big uh, fish enthusiast. So when my other colleague told me that he had to go home early that day because he planned on going to bed early because he had to get up at 3 a.m. to meet everybody at the Chesapeake at 5, I actually felt very happy that I had not gone with the trip. And, um, but when my colleague came back the next day and I asked him how it went, he said they had caught their quota of fish by 7.30 in the morning. At 8 o'clock, they were back on shore in the restaurant. They'd given their fish in to be clean, and they were eating. They had a very big catch, you know, so much that they were done so early. For some people, fishing is a hobby. For me, it was just a reason to go along with friends from work to, you know, spend some time together. But for Peter, it wasn't a hobby. It was his business. It was his life. Whether he just, in our story today, whether he just had one bad trip or a string of bad days, our passage doesn't tell us. But Peter seems a little unhappy or frustrated, perhaps, here in our passage. Because Peter is a pro. He knows fish. He knows nets. He knows boats. He knows the Sea of Galilee. He knows the best time to fish is, late, is, is at night or early in the morning. He knows the best place to go in the Sea of Galilee is in the shallow water, right where the um, streams will be coming in and oxygenate the water. I'm sure he didn't know anything about oxygen at the time, but he knew that fresh water was a place to be looking for fish. And he knows you usually don't go fishing in late morning. And, um, oh, I'm the one that does the slides here. Um, yeah, he knows that you don't go fishing late in the morning or near noon in the Lake of Galilee because it's a hot climate. And depending on where you fish, other things, you know, I mean, depending on where you go, like if you're at the Chesapeake versus the uh, Sea of Galilee, two different bodies of water, two different dynamics. The Chesapeake is affected a lot by wind and tides. But this is, um, this here is what's on Peter's mind. And this is actually a catch from the Lake of Galilee, by the way. 
and he had just spent the night fishing without anything to show for it. So it's not very good for a guy like Peter's bank account. And then Jesus comes along and asks him to do something that Peter thinks probably is a little bit ridiculous, and given the crowd that's around, possibly a little bit embarrassing. Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. In broad daylight, you know, with all these people around, and for people, uh, for Peter, it probably feels like Jesus is going to add a little bit of public embarrassment to what's already been financial injury that he's feeling. And anyway, bah, you know, here's a carpenter, or rather a stonemason, telling a fisherman to go out in the, in the broad daylight like this. But the problem is that Peter owes Jesus a favor. Jesus, in chapter 4, right before this, Jesus had just healed Peter's mother-in-law. And, you know, for some people that might not seem like a favor. But for obviously, for Peter, it, it did seem like a favor. And if someone does you a good deed, you owe them one. And so Peter let Jesus teach from his boat. You know, right before this, remember, he's out there. Jesus asked to be out in the boat. And so Peter does that. Peter goes along with that. Then Peter has been um, asked one more time, one more request by Jesus. Now remember, healing's a big thing, and so Peter goes along with it. But maybe we might be detecting something a little bit um, hesitant here from Peter. Peter reluctantly goes out, and of course there's a great catch, probably the biggest catch of Peter's career. So switching gears a little bit, just to talk about the, the structure of our story, this story is what they call a call narrative. Call narratives are something they have a lot of in the Bible. There's a call of Abraham to leave his father and mother and go out by faith into a new land, and that God is going to bless the whole world through his seed. There's a call of Moses at the burning bush. God says, Moses, I've heard the cry of my mistreated people, and I'm going to come down, and you are going to help me. And guess what? I'm going to do all this through you, Moses. And then there's a call of Gideon. That might be a little bit more remote, but um, he's, gonna, he's to take down the Midianite army. And then we also know about the call of Paul, who was on his way to persecute Christians, and he gets blinded by this heavenly light, where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And while each of these calls is very specific to the person being called, all of them are instructive, or there's something there for us to learn. So, for example, if we're going to walk by faith, like Abraham, we're going to have to go into uncharted territory by faith. And like Moses, God still hears his people crying and suffering. And note, remember in that call that Moses objects. Hey, I can't speak. I, ha I have a disability. Well, but God says, hey, yes, you have a disability, but remember who's calling you. I'm going to be with you, and I'm the part that counts. And like Gideon, in that story, there's too many people. You know, usually we don't think of that as being a problem, but God doesn't want us to have so many people or so much power on our own that we start to think that it's all my strength. He wants us to be reminded that it's his strength. And so God does something great through Gideon's smallness. And I was thinking about our group here. We have people here in the seventh grade who, frankly, might be feeling, you know, a little bit small since, you know, there's people here a little bit big. But um, whether you're in the seventh grade and just moved up or bigger, God wants to do something big, even with small people. And like, and like the Apostle Paul, sometimes we are quite blind and we need God to open up our eyes. So there's instructions for each one of us in these call nar narratives. And today we have the call of Peter. And by the way, if you call yourself a Christian, you also have been called. So listen up. If God calls us, maybe like Moses, God will push us beyond our normal everyday comfort. And like Peter, maybe God is going to do something big. Not because big is always better, but God's love and grace are vast, okay? So big in the sense, like what Paul says in the book of Ephesians, that God is going to do immeasurably beyond all that we ask or think. And every time God talks about building his family or building his kingdom, there's always a bigness or a vastness to his kingdom. 
It's like when Jesus said that God's kingdom starts off like a small seed, but then it grows to a large tree so big that all the birds of the air can come and nest in it. And when he says that it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. For the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is not some little backyard barbecue. He says, my kingdom is going to be a very big banquet. Okay? And so God wants to send his people out on the highways and byways and urge people to come into his house that it might be full. He wants more and more people that are going to be able to enjoy his goodness and his blessings. So in our story today, we talk about this big catch. Now the real catch in our story is not really the fish. The big catch for Peter, uh, for, for Jesus, is Peter and his followers, his companions. So now Jesus has more people, more fishers to go out. And my hope and my prayer for sorry. <laughs> It's kind of tough when you're really going to stand on the foot. My prayer for us is that whether you're in the seventh grade or 77, that God will catch you and get a hold of you. And even those of you who are still checking things out, maybe you haven't committed yourself to Christ yet, I still hope that God is going to capture your heart and put you on his mission. So our big catch starts out with a boat and with Peter's willingness to take it out for Jesus. Like I said, the first time that, that Peter gets into the boat with Jesus is to teach a crowd that's gathered there. After all, sound travels faster over water. And as I mentioned, Peter, for Peter, it's an easy way to pay back for healing his mother-in-law. But after the sermon, Jesus tells Peter, let's go catch fish. Let's go catch fish. And Peter, in spite of knowing better, puts out to sea. He goes along with it, even though Jesus doesn't know anything about fishing. And, uh, but uh, like I said, Peter humors him. Now, note the tone in verse 5. As I mentioned, it's in your bulletin. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And I, I think this kind of translates into maybe more modern language. Hey, teacher, I really don't think there's any fish to be had, but because I owe you one, I'll do it. And note that Peter dresses, addresses Peter, I'm sorry, Peter addresses Jesus with the name teacher. And that can be translated, and some of your translations might say master or teacher, or you might say boss or chief. And so they go out, and then we have the big catch. So this stonemason really knows something about fish. And look at Peter's response. Then Peter says, get away from me, Lord. Not teacher or master here. He changes the word. Get away from me, Lord. Get away from me because I'm a sinner and my sin might rub off on you, off on you holy man. Or maybe your holiness is going to burn me up or judge me or something like that. Whatever it is. Peter feels that there's a big gap between himself and Jesus. And right before the catch, Peter saw himself quite bigger than he actually is, and Jesus smaller than Jesus actually is. But now he's got it right. Jesus is huge, and he is Lord, and Peter is small and sinful. But instead of getting away from Jesus, instead of getting away from Peter, Jesus actually says very gracious words to Peter. Fear not, he tells him, because Jesus can deal with Peter's sin. And he even goes on to say to Peter, from now on, let's go out and catch people. The boat comes back in, but Peter goes out. Peter leaves the boat, the nets, and maybe his biggest financial catch ever, and he goes out with Jesus. So Peter must be thinking, Jesus, if this is your mission and you're behind it, I am all on board. And since then, one of the earliest Christian symbols has been a boat. This actually comes from the catacombs. Because Peter was called by Jesus in a boat. 
And the church is like a boat that goes out to catch fish. But for many of us, and myself included, so I'm, I'm, I'm in on this uh, sermon here. It's not just for you, it's for me. There's a problem with the kind of boat that we've imagined. We're okay with this boat idea, but we'd like to have a cruise ship. Okay? We want the best equipment, the best creature comforts, and we want even all that entertainment that goes along with the boat. And, you know, some of these boats, they even have a pool. And not only that, they have these large buffets of food on the boat. All you can eat, all the time, even at midnight. It's unbelievable. And, and there are these fantastic views that you can see from the boat, and from the comfort of your seat, and you don't even have to leave the boat. And there's entertainment every night, okay? And I'm not sure why you're here. Maybe it's some of you don't have a choice choice to be here, but maybe you know you're thinking, golly, they got a lounge there at church now with coffee and tea, and sometimes they even have donuts. And not only that, there's even Chinese food to have every Sunday, and there's all kinds of kids activities, and you can drop your kids off with free childcare, and and we have happy, friendly people that you might be happy to get to know, and. Um, Hey, we don't have a pool, but we have a pool table, and hey, hey, we even have a Wii Game Center. Uh, okay, I know I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but anyway, when people come to church, it's often without thinking that they come, and they want to come in and, and you know, be on a cruise. And there's some churches that are even like that, and, um, but, but anyway, I struggle with this when I come in, because frankly speaking, I would like to be on a cruise. And, um, but the church is not a cruise ship. The church is a rescue boat. Okay. It's a rescue boat. Now, on a cruise ship, everything is about pleasing the passengers that they want to keep comfortable and cushy. On a rescue boat, there are no passengers. Everybody's crew. And they want to keep, and, and, um, and on the, cruise ship, every, sorry, on the, on the rescue boat, everybody has a job, okay? And I struggle because of my human nature, because I prefer cruising to rescuing. But God wants us to change our thoughts, so God help me to change my attitude, because there's people desperate out there. There's fish that need to be caught. Now, some of you clever people are saying there's a big difference between fishing for fish and fishing for people. When, for, when you fish for fish, you make their lives worse. When you fish for, for people, you make their lives better. When you fish for fish, you bring it out of the water, the safety of the water, and your intention is to scale it, gut it, cook it, and eat it. When you fish for people, you take them out of troubled waters, you dry them off, keep them warm, and you're going to have to feed them probably. So Jesus is showing us that he and his people are on a big search and rescue mission. Jesus said in other places, I come to seek and to save those who are lost. And he's sending us on the same search and rescue mission. And he knows that if you want to rescue people or catch people or save people, you have to bring them into the safety of dry land. You're going to have to go out to deep water and rescue them. Not in the shallow waters. People can walk themselves out of shallow problems, shallow waters. But it's the people who are in deep waters who need rescuing. And I'm not sure if you realize this, um, kind of switch it a little bit here to, to, to some mentality about deep water, but the ancients were not fond of deep waters. And if you're out in the middle of the ocean and start to feel a storm, you may not be happy about deep waters either. Jesus told Peter to go out deep Deep waters can be murky and scary. And maybe it wasn't a problem for Peter, but for the likes of me, a land lover, it, it, is, it is a little bit scary. Deep water is often symbolic of danger and chaos. You see this some in the passage of Scripture. For example, in the Psalms, he says, Problems roll over me like waves and breakers crashing on me. Or as another translation says, I hear the tumult and raging of the seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. 
And in the book of James, he says, those who are double-minded are being tossed along as of the um, uh, waves and winds. So for many of us, deep water is what they need to be rescued from. So here's another one. Okay. But anyway, have you ever been drowning in depression? Or have you ever been flooded with anxiety or fear? Have you ever been inundated by too many things to do? Have you ever been drowning from overwork? Or have you been adrift in aimlessness or sinking in grief? Or have you ever been plunged into ruin or capsized because of some addiction? Have you ever been shipwrecked because of some moral failure or engulfed in guilt or submerged in shame or have you ever been swamped with cares or deluged with circumstances beyond your control? Have you ever been cast away by loneliness? Or have you been soaked in family grief? Or floundering in doubt about God or purpose or if there's any meaning to it all? If any of these problems are currently yours or ever have been, please raise your signal flag. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, um, yeah, it's like everybody. And, um, you know, there's a few of us that have perfect lives, but I guess others are just a little too embarrassed to raise your hand. Okay, but my point is, and I think you know, that all of us, at some time, we have to be rescued. And what does Jesus, Peter, and the big catch teach us about God's heart for us? He knows that we have gotten all of ourselves into deep water. And Jesus shows mercy. Jesus is concerned about Peter, and Jesus is concerned about us, because all of us need to be rescued from deep water in one way or another. And anybody who's thinking here that, are we trying to convert people? Well, maybe we are, but actually, we're just messengers. It's not our job to convert. It's God's job to convert. It's our job to bring a message. And I know some of you are not convinced, and you're thinking, this fishing for people here at church sounds like fishing on the internet. And, um, you know, they're trying to get your online passwords and all so that they can get your money. We don't want your bank account, okay? But we also don't want you to be drowning in life's troubles. And we're not going to hammer you on the head with the Bible. And we're not going to stand in the street with signs telling you to turn or burn. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want anybody to do that to me, and Jesus didn't do it like that. We want to be like Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And we want, and we know that faith in God is not a, an instantaneous thing like that. That faith in God is a process. And we respect the process. Take as long as you need. You might notice here that Peter, he just went through, he was a tough nut to crack. He just went through the miracles in chapter 4. He was on board with Jesus preaching a wonderful sermon. All these sermons that uh, Jesus had, had given that morning, you know, Peter was, it was on Peter's boat. And he wasn't moved, okay? It wasn't until Jesus brought about the big catch of fish that he really got Peter's attention. Can you believe that? A miracle? Then all these sermons by Jesus? And still, no change. It took the fish for Peter to change. Now, changing gears a little bit, when people get rescued in an accident, often the people who get rescued turn right around and rescue others because they see the need for all hands to be on deck. They see the mission at hand because they just got themselves out of it. And um, you, you, you just heard about this in the news in Houston, right after Hurricane Harvey, when people got rescued from the flooding and got into safety, what did they do? They turned around and just started helping other people. Same thing about the famous um, Bucket Brigade in New York City right after 9-11, okay? And the same thing just happened again in Mexico City, in, in Mexico, right after the earthquakes there. These are the Bucket Brigades of people helping people get out of the uh, the, the, the dire straits of, the, of the, the problem that just happened, the earthquake there in 9-11 with the buildings crashing. The people, often the people who just got rescued turn right around and rescue others. 
So when you get rescued from a disaster, if you're able-bodied, you want to help others. And so remember us here in the church that we're on a rescue boat. It's all about the people who are not on board yet with our mission. And if you're praying for God's blessings in your life, pray not so that you can enjoy the ride on the ship, but pray so that you can be a blessing to others. For those of us who've been rescued, after we recover, we all have something to contribute. And remember, we need all hands on deck. And just like there are many tasks on a rescue boat, such as navigation, steering, fueling, feeding the crew, keeping watch for people out on the waters, bringing people on board, the same thing at the church. Like using your music skills for the praise team, helping out with icebreakers on Friday night, helping out with the media team, helping clean ice and snow in the winter. You know, on Sunday morning, we have people that get here quite early. The greeters and musicians and the media team, they're all here very early. We have folks that help with things that are not obvious, such as chasing down microphones and, and um, straightening chairs and sometimes looking for the chair right, I'm on right here when it's not here, setting up for lunch, cooking, cleanup, teaching Sunday school, all kinds of things. Now, my wife gave me another uh, illustration that's not like this uh, rescue one, but a very one close uh, to a lot of people's hearts. And that is the church is not a buffet like on the cruise ship that I showed you. The church is more like a potluck dinner. I know you've all been to potluck dinners, and if you've been to enough, sometimes it happens that only a few folks will bring food. And when that happens, there's slim pickings, okay? There's just not that much food to go around. And so think about yourself in this uh, rescue boat. How can you help? Okay, or think about yourself at the buffet. You know, what can you bring? You probably see areas all the time where you, where you think we need help. And for some of these things, it's so easy, you don't even have to ask somebody. Just do it. But if something is complicated, then, then talk to the church leaders and, and ask them, you know, you know how, how can you help with this problem? But we need all hands on deck. And in addition to that, we need to be focused outside these walls. The reason we do all these things inside, and we need a lot of help inside, but the reason we do all these things inside the church is remember for those outside the church. So some of you can invite your fellow students to, to things on Friday night. Others can invite things here to Sunday morning or things like the Cross-Cultural Couples Fellowship. And we are going out and doing some other things like working at the Ronald McDonald House in the future. So, or you just might be there in your neighborhood and see somebody there, like your neighbor that needs help, or a colleague at school or at work who's in some kind of deep water. If you've never mentioned Christ to your friends, start off simple. So, for example, ask them on Monday, what did you do this weekend? That often comes up at work. What did you do this weekend? Well, um, I heard this interesting message about people being in deep water or whatever it is. Okay, be willing to help the people that you see who are in deep water. And if they're not talking about being in deep water, chances are it's just a matter that they're not comfortable talking about the deep water that they're in. But whatever it is, take your next step because we're on a rescue boat. So I'm going to finish now with two things. One is prosaic, meaning not poetic, and then the last one is poetic. The Coast Guard have a saying, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. Okay, that's the Coast Guard there. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And the Coast Guard handbook is often referred to as the Blue Book, as you can see right there. Now, it's, uh, where this saying came from is not clear, but there was a letter to the editor of the 1954 Coast Guard magazine that tells a story where this saying comes from. There was a, a storm near Cape Hatteras and off the coast of North Carolina, and so the, the Coast Guard was involved in a rescue there. A ship was stranded off the coast, and someone reported that the ship had run into dangerous shoals, run aground out into the, to the water. So an old skipper gave the command to man the lifeboat, and then one of the men shouted out, they might make it out to the wreck, 
but they'd never make it back. Then the old skipper looked around and said, the blue book says we've got to go out. It doesn't say a bleeping thing about having to come back. And where did this idea come from? You know, where did the skipper get this idea from? Well, the 1899 regulations on life-saving service, that's what the Coast Guard used to be called, the life-saving service, uh, refers to something. Not, not those words exactly. It first tells the rescuer to select a boat or a lifeline or whatever he thinks is appropriate. If what he first attempts fails, then he's to attempt the rescue with something else. And it states, um, in attempting the rescue, he will not desist from his efforts until, this is the, yeah, until by actual trial the impossibility of effecting a rescue is demonstrated. The statement of the keeper, that's, that's the Coast Guard man, that's the way they refer to them because they were, they were lighthouse keepers originally. The statement of the keeper that he did not try to use the boat because the sea or the surf was too heavy will not be accepted unless attempts to launch it were actually made and failed. In other words, you can't just say, oh, it's too, too bad, it's too rough. You got to try and try again. The 1934 edition of the instructions for the United States Coast Guard stations copied this, this saying up here word for word as it appeared in the 1899 version. So if the Coast Guard's philosophy is this, you know, that you got to go out, what should ours be? We got to go out. Okay? And as I said, we need all hands on deck. So changing gears a little bit, I'm going to close now with a poem. And, uh, or sorry, a poem. <laughs> um, I don't know how I got to that pronunciation, but anyway, it's a poetic thing. Okay? The poem, the poem is uh, um, written by somebody named Amy Carmichael, and it's actually in your bulletin. Amy Carmichael was an Irish woman, and um, yeah, there she is. And she was an Irish woman who became a missionary first to Japan, but then later to India. And she went off to India, spent like 50 years there without even going home to England or Ireland for a furlough. She set up orphanages, firstly for, for women, for girls, uh, who, were in, uh, who, who were given up to temple prostitution in, in India, and uh, later orphanages for anybody. And there are people alive today who were rescued by her. You can go into YouTube and, and hear these old Indian ladies talking about uh, their, their involvement with Amy Carmichael. But when I finish today, Um, um, I want to finish with a prayer. And uh, this is kind of hard because, as I told Wendy yesterday, I want to be on a cruise ship. Uh, you know, it's human nature. We don't want to go out. We like the comforts. We're, we're human beings. We enjoy creature comforts. So, let's pray. I'm just going to use the point here from Amy. From prayer that asks that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on me. From fearing when I should, sorry, yeah, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher. From silken self, O captain free, thy soldier who would follow thee. From subtle love of softening things, from easy choices, weakenings. Not thus are spirits fortified. Not this way with the crucified. From all that dims thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay. I lost my place. The passion that will burn like fire. Sorry, I totally got lost. 
from subtle love of softening things, from easy choices, weakenings. Not thus are spirits fortified, not this way with the crucified. From all that dims thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. May it be for me and for all of us. In Jesus' name.